almost August in Indiana again. It's a beautiful day outside and I was just thinking it's getting close to time where we're going to start breeding our sheep and goats again. Now most of our ewes and does are out on pasture at various farms that we have and it's getting to be about that time where they're going to be coming back home and we're going to be putting them in for breeding. And it got me thinking about a recent conversation I had with Dr. Woody Lane about hybrid vigor. I want to make a video today to talk about that. Stay tuned to find out more. Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lanasa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. So today we're talking about hybrid vigor. We're going to talk about a few key points. What is hybrid vigor? What are some of the good points and bad points to remember about hybrid vigor? What are the realistic expectations that you should have when crossbreeding your sheep and goats? And what are some of the ethical things that you should take into consideration when crossbreeding your sheep and goats. So when we talk about hybrid vigor, what is it? Well, the easiest way to think about this is to think about a mutt. And a mutt is a common term that we use here in the United States for a crossbred dog. And there's something very interesting about mutts, and that is they tend to be healthier, they tend to have less genetic problems, they tend to live longer. Just overall, they seem to do better. And why is this? Well, that's because of hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor is when you have two different types of animals within the same species that breed with one another. And what ends up happening is, is that you get some good genetic traits from both of these different breeds when they breed together. And those better genetic breeds tend to manifest themselves in that specific offspring. So essentially those dominant traits, the good dominant traits from those different breeds come together and you have a healthier, more fertile, just a better animal in general. Why am I talking to you about this? Well, for some of you, this may be very, very valuable. And that is especially for those of you that are running a commercial operation. Now we all have our favorite breeds. We all have specific breeds that we like to keep on our farm. But what I'm going to tell you today is you may want to consider bringing in a different type of breed into your operation, especially if you're running a commercial operation and interbreeding them into your flock or your herd. This can help immensely with overall size, shape, structure, conformation, putting on that valuable weight that you may need in order to run a successful commercial operation. It may increase fertility, so on and so forth. But there are a few things that you need to consider and a few realistic expectations that you need to have before you do this. We recently interviewed Dr. Woody Lane and we talked about hybrid vigor. I had mentioned specific breeds. There's a lot of folks out there on the internet that are saying, this breed is worm resistant. Do you think people pay too much attention to breeds specifically and not enough attention to genetics? Breeds are something you can see. I mean, Bakewell in the 1700s laid the groundwork on that. The first American breed was George, George Washington's farm created it. You know, we've gone back with breeds, but that was, that was very important before we had a lot more science. And it is still important because you can identify, you got the phenotype, you can look at the animal and go, oh, that's, that's a Suffolk, that's a Lincoln, that's whatever. And there's, Met metabolic differences between them. But if you're in no-nonsense business, why would you be selling purebreds unless you had a purebred situation? All right, that's a specialized market. But if I have 2,000 sheep and I'm trying to make my livelihood on it, what I want is high producers. Right. I don't, and a purebred breed by definition doesn't have hybrid vigor unless you use it on opposite ram, which is great. You could do that. But usually crossbred animals, they're more vigorous, et cetera, et cetera. You've got more flexibility if you don't worry about which breed. Now, I'm talking commercial here. If someone is selling purebred animals, that's what their breed. But a commercial situation, you can you can get more than a 200% lamb crop, very vigorous, vibrant animals, very good in terms of surviving and, if necessary, parasite more resistance by crossbreeding. Now, which breed do you choose to do that? We've got a lot of science knowing that. On the other hand, I've gone to a lot of shows and I've watched rams walk across a show ring. They would not make a cut in a commercial thing. They can't walk right. 
There's right. something wrong with it. And, and you know, that whole world has gone off in a different direction. Yeah. We and, have lambs that they're, they're obsessed about the leg wool. Uh, you know, they're like, they, you and, know, and explain to me, someone explained to me by looking at an animal, you could tell her that she's going to give twins and it's going to be a good mother. Right. You can't. That's the same technology that we were using in county fairs in 1830. And that's what we're basing it on now. We know more than that. So what are some considerations that you need to know when thinking about hybrid vigor? Well, the first one is it isn't a perfect system. And that is to say that just because you breed two different breeds together doesn't mean you're going to get this super awesome uh, crossbreed that's going to give you everything that you need. You never can quite tell what traits an animal is going to inherit from mom or which traits that animal is going to inherit from dad. And you could end up with uh, more traits from one side than the other. Some things are dominant. So again, we're looking at making healthier animals. We're looking at increasing uh, fertility, things like that. But you never know what you might get. And you need to do your research to determine what traits tend to be dominant and what traits tend to be recessive. So for instance, if you run hair sheep and you consider bringing in a wool sheep to breed on them, you should realistically consider the fact that most of your offspring are going to have wool. Wool tends to be a more dominant trait, and so it's something that you need to consider. So what can you do for this? Well, if you're raising wool breeds, you can bring in a different type of wool breed. Perhaps you're raising white face, uh, such as a Dorset, Columbia, something like that. And maybe you need a little bit more size, shape, and structure. You could bring in a black face, a more terminal animal that tends to grow a little bit faster. If you don't care if you have wool or if you have hair, you can even bring in a hair breed, such as a Katahdin or a Dorper, to breed on your wool sheep. Uh, these are realistic options for you to consider. So we want you to have realistic expectations about what it is that you're going to get. Now we have ran into this multiple times when crossbreeding goats. We really like to crossbreed in dairy breeds, uh, dairy does on a larger frame buck, perhaps bringing in a boar buck or bringing in a Kiko buck, something like that, that's got a little bit more size, shape, and structure. So why do we do this? Well, we found over decades of raising goats that our boar moms tend to lack a little bit in milk production. So by breeding in some dairy breeds on a boar, we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. We're getting a little bit more size, shape, and structure, but we're also getting better milk production. So that would be an example. They also tend to be a little healthier and a little thriftier. So that's just one example. Uh, when it comes to sheep, we've had traditionally a lot of white face sheep, such as pulled dorsets. We've brought in some black face terminal sires, such as Suffolk. Um, and what we find is that we get a little bit better body carcass size, we get a little bit more length, we get a little bit better leg. So these are just a few examples of what you can get. Now, I will tell you, when it comes to color, uh, boy, that is a lot tougher. And that's a prime example of how you never know what you're going to get. We have bred dapple goats on dapple goats and we've gotten solid colors. We've bred solid colors on solid colors and got dapples. We've bred boar on Alpine and had the baby come out and look almost exactly like a boar. Uh, we've done it and had them come out looking almost exactly like an Alpine. So again, the best way to get around this is, is to keep stock that you like, keep a good record saying, this is what I bred them on, this is what my outcome was, and you're going to learn. You're gonna learn that some of your moms are gonna throw a specific type of kid if they're bred on a specific uh, buck. Some of your ewes are gonna throw a specific type of lamb if bred on a specific type of ram, and so on and so forth. So it's not enough just to throw a couple different um, types of animals together, a couple different breeds together. You've gotta do it, and then you've gotta look at what the outcome is and keep records of this. Do your homework when you go to the breeder to purchase the animal, see what they tend to throw uh, genetically, see what they tend to throw 
consistently and you'll have a better idea of what to expect moving forward. Now, when we get into the ethics of this, this is where things can get tricky. Crossbreeding is probably not right for you if you are raising a very specific breed. You know this and I know this, there are a lot of cheaters out there. There are individuals that will raise an animal. Um, let's use Pull Dorset as an example. They have Pull Dorset, they sell registered pulled dorsets and perhaps they bring in a blackface terminal sire, breed it into the flock to get better confirmation and then breed it back out. Every breed has specific breed standards. That could be hoof color, that could be nose color, wool color, things like that. Same thing comes up with boars uh, and other goats. So when you get into the ethics of this, it is extremely unethical for you to sell an animal as a specific breed when you know that it's not. You can really screw up someone's farm by selling them an animal that you tell them it's one thing, but it's actually another. Everybody wants to win. I get that, winning is awesome, but when you're cheating to win, that's something that you're gonna have to live with. I'm not the police, I'm not the one to tell you if what you're doing is right or wrong, but I think it's very important for you to consider ethical outcomes when you are selling livestock to a farm. I don't know about you, but if I went to buy a boar goat and someone told me, oh, this thing is papered, it's 100% boar goat, and they just simply cook the books and it's not, I bring that in and I breed that into my herd, I'm gonna be pretty pissed off when I get some weird things happening when I start to have babies. So very important to keep in mind. An example of this, I'll tell you, uh, I bought a registered 100% pulled dorset buck uh, years ago. I bred him on everything, all of my ewes, and the next year I started having all of these black wool colored babies coming out that I couldn't sell as pulled dorsets. I couldn't show them as pulled dorsets. And that really messed up my farm. Of course, it's not even worth my time reaching out to the producer because he or she are just gonna give me a line and it's not worth my time. But again, ethics are important. Please keep that in mind. Crossbreeding and hybrid vigor may be something that can help your farm. Then again, it may not. That's going to be up to you to decide if that fits in well with your breeding program, your breeding regimen, and when you take all of the ethical considerations into account. I'm Tim from Lanasa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.